All right, let's get started. Today is um, really uh, a wonderful day to welcome you uh, to the University of Chicago's inaugural uh, Global Health Day. And uh, uh, since the uh, morning, we've been celebrating global health. And this is a beautiful room to welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Fumi Olopade, and I'm the Associate Dean for Global Health and the Director of the University of Chicago uh, Global Health Initiative. Uh, one of the uh, discussions I had uh, early this morning was really how we build a true interdisciplinary center uh, right at the center of campus so that we can move across Ellis. For those of you who have been here for many, many years, you know the division between Ellis, whether you're on the one side of Ellis or the other side of Ellis. Uh, but uh, it's wonderful to have my dean here. And uh, I'm actually going to ask uh, uh, Comb to come up because it really symbolizes what we're trying to do, where we are not making this a medical event. We're making it a true collaborative, um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration. You may take my seat here. So earlier today, we hosted a panel discussion on opportunities in global health. And um, we're honored to have uh, our Ambassador uh, Malen uh, Ververe here with us. And uh, I cannot but thank her, and I don't think I can thank her enough for accepting to come. And uh, I want to also recognize uh, Ambassador Faye Hattoglevin, who was a uh, former ambassador in the Netherlands, who actually allowed us to have this coup. So thank you. Um, Earlier today, when we uh, hosted the uh, opportunities in global health, what we were really trying to do was to make sure that we could get scholars across the university to come to the medical center. And we had that event in the medical center. And it was interesting that a lot of the questions we fielded from the students had nothing to do with medicine as we practiced it across Ellis. It was all about access to health, you know, activism, you know, what is it that we're doing about development. So that's why global health is really not about international medicine or international health. It's about health and wellness. And so we've really thought about harnessing the expertise of scholars across campus. Right, that we need to get everybody engaged. We need to engage people in economics, uh, people in the Computational Institute, public policy, and that uh, in the true Chicago way, we will be quantitative in our approach to global health, and we will try to get uh, uh, students to actually go and get the evidence that will inform policy that we're going to do it in an ethical manner. And I see that uh, Mark Siegler is here, who has been transforming the world with, uh, through the McLean Center for Medical Ethics. So we truly have got everybody really engaged and fired up to go. And as we thought about this event, we thought about who would be our natural partners. And that's where the International House came in. They are celebrating 80 years of global voices. And when I travel across uh, in my role as associate dean, I meet students. And the first thing they want to ask about is, how is I house? I had such a great uh, time there. And you see all these flags representing uh, 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 you know, the, the, the wonderful place that the International House is because it brings people to campus at the time when they're impressionable. It gives them a welcoming home. And uh, this is one of the, f what, five uh, international houses in the country? Or on the in the world? No, but established, by the established by the Rockefeller Foundation. And so for those of you who know the, uh, the um, history of our university, Rockefeller has really all been about opening uh, new opportunities, thinking about locating a university in an urban center. And I think our Global Health uh, Initiative is really honoring that uh, promise of our, our founding uh, uh, faculty where we use scholarship, that's you know, University of Chicago scholarship, to engage and, uh, uh, in multidisciplinary ways and uh, develop innovative approaches to the numerous health challenges faced by people all over the world. So as we transition uh, from an initiative 
to really a center that is filled with students and scholars. Uh, what we're hoping is that we're going to continue to collaborate with communities locally and globally. Uh, that you know, uh, you know, John Dewey worked here before, and so it's all about education, democratizing the education. Uh, increasing service learning opportunities because he was also the one who said, you know, what's the value of an education if you can't really use it to, for social good? Uh, we're going to advance novel transdisciplinary and sustainable solutions. And when we were talking about novel transdisciplinary, I said only a University of Chicago student will understand that. <laughs> right? Because it's not multidisciplinary, it's not interdisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary. And the goal is that it would improve health and well-being while reducing global health disparities and uh, inequities. And so, it, really, I want to welcome all of you. I also want to welcome the uh, Center for International Studies because these are our college partners who bring students to uh, think about global health. Let me go on and introduce my dean, uh, because uh, Dean Pol Polonsky really uh, understands what it means to uh, bring, uh, just one second. <laughs> uh, 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 Ken Polonsky is the Richard T. Crane Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Executive uh, Vice President for Medical Affairs. Uh, he's dean of the Division of the Biological Sciences and dean of Pritzker School of uh, Medicine. Uh, is a prominent diabetes researcher, physician, and educator. And when I briefed him about this day, uh, he said, look, we have three missions. It's, you know, education, research, and service. And that everywhere we go, anything we do, it has to be all those three things, you know, coming together. Uh, we want to engage our community, and that's why when the I House sent the notice out, they said, oh, we're going to get people from the community who come to our event, and they're going to be here. Uh, the United Nations has uh, recently um, really de made a declaration on chronic non-communicable conditions. And diabetes is one of the fastest growing problems that we need to solve in the world. Right? And who better to lead us in that charge than our own uh, dean who spent all of his life really thinking about diabetes. Uh, he started his medical school at the University of Witswatersrand in South Africa and he came to Chicago. Uh, he had a period of time when he went away from Chicago, but Chicago is really home to him, and so he's back. And, uh, and I think that uh, I can't think of uh, you know, studying genetics of diabetes without putting it in the social context. So we're going to do urban global and global urban because there are too many problems in the world that we have to solve. And so please welcome uh, uh, Dean Polonsky. So thank you very much for me. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I would also really like to thank uh, Ambassador Vivier for agreeing to come. It's a real honor, and Ambassador Levine for the role that you played in the invitation, and obviously Fumi for all of the energy and enthusiasm uh, that she brings to this task. So this is the University of Chicago is obviously a very good place in which to think about uh, international programs and global health. Uh, for those of you who've heard him speak about it, uh, our president, President Zimmer, uh, talks about the University of Chicago as being devoted to two things, uh, eminence and impact. Uh, and I think we are very committed to having eminent programs. And if one is going to have an impact uh, in 2012, you can't just have it locally. You have to have it nationally and internationally. I think uh, the ambassador has already got a sense from the meetings that you've had that this is an international community. Uh, we all have funny accents uh, that have come from different parts of the world. Uh, it is a melting pot of uh, interesting ideas, uh, and people have a perspective that uh, goes well beyond uh, the confines of the university in Hyde Park. Uh, now, the, the other reason that uh, we view uh, participation in global health as an imperative is that uh, our trainees and our faculty actually demand it. Uh, so for medical students now, uh, when they look around at medical schools, the very best medical students uh, want to go to a medical school uh, which offers experiences uh, overseas. Uh, the amount, and I, I think it is a cause for great optimism uh, for the future of medicine worldwide, 
that medical students in tra that students in training to become doctors uh, have such a global perspective and really want to make a global impact. Uh, the residents who are undergoing training after medical school uh, want to go to foreign countries and learn about the challenges of health uh, across the world. Uh, and then obviously our faculty uh, have numerous activities. So this is something that is, is very, very natural to us. Uh, I'm delighted that Fumi invited Combe to come up onto the podium as well because I think it's through uh, other parts of the university like the Harris School uh, but also the social sciences uh, and other areas of the university that we can really put together very special programs. So I'm delighted to be here, looking forward very much to the Ambassador's uh, presentation and uh, we certainly have a big future ahead of us in global health. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of the time people talk about the Chicago um, men, uh, but I think the Chicago women actually <laughs> is where it, uh, it happens. And, uh, and so uh, I want to introduce Susan Scher. And Susan is a true Chicago woman, a uh, mover and shaker. And uh, before uh, First Lady went to uh, the White House, I remember that um, uh, Suzanne and, uh, and all of us really would think about how to change the world. <laughs> and uh, it actually happened. And uh, there's still a lot of work for us to do. But uh, 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 Suzanne Sher is the Executive Vice President for Corporate Strategy and Public Affairs at the University of Chicago Medical Center and Senior Advisor to the President of the University. So she really represents both uh, parts of the university that are in fact one university. And previously uh, Susan served in the White House as Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to First Lady Michelle Obama where she was also a liaison to the Jewish uh, community. Uh, she served as uh, Associate White House Counsel, where she worked on health care reform and legal issues relating to the First Lady's office. Before going to Washington, she was schooled on the south side of Chicago <laughs> on what it means to take care of your community, uh, what it means to engage women in your community. And I can tell you that every time I said, yes, you know, the First Lady and I used to go and do community events in October to mark Breast Cancer Awareness Month and how far she has gone. I'm always pleased to say I'm one of, I know the Chicago women and that Suzanne is one of the Chicago women and now what we really want to do is say the Chicago women are making a big difference on the global stage. So Suzanne. Thank you, Fumi, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll try to make my introduction of the main speaker a little bit shorter because she just asked me to not speak on and on about her. Um, Fumi, the work that you've done on global health issues, I've been a, a friend and admirer for a really long time, so it's very exciting for me to be here today um, to help celebrate Global Health Day, but also to help launch um, from initiative into the University of Chicago Center for Global Health. And I cannot think of a better, uh, more appropriate speaker than to help celebrate this than um, our main speaker, Ambassador uh, Milan Revere, who has become a friend and colleague of mine. Um, Ambassador Revere, and I promise I'll be brief about your biography, but she grew up in Pennsylvania and went to Georgetown University got a bachelor's and then a master's in um, Russian studies. But two other very important events happened there as far as I can tell. The first is she met her husband. And the second is they met this undergraduate there named Bill Clinton. Um, and the course of history perhaps was changed by all of that. Um, her entire life has been devoted to public service, some of it in government and some for an incredible group of not-for-profits that she's worked in. So she worked for the late Senator George McGovern and Congressman Marcy Kaptur, um, People for the American Way, Common Cause, all in, in incredible organizations. 
um, the U.S. Catholic Conference. And then when Bill Clinton was elected president of the United States, the Clintons prevailed upon Ambassador Revere to come to the White House. And this is where she became um, a member of what I will call a very small exclusive but very supportive bipartisan group of which I am a part and that is she became assistant to the president and chief of staff to First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, and in that in that role as her chief of staff they did some um, incredible work and I have to say that coming to the White House a lot later we were able to benefit from the great work that she and uh, the First Lady had done. So she was responsible for overseeing the First Lady's global initiatives on women's rights as human rights and obviously we can't under overemphasize the importance of that work. In addition, she established the President's Interagency Council on Women. And it sounds kind of bureaucratic, but what it did, it was really became a model for governments in addressing the issues of concern to women. And President Obama has a White House Council on Women and Girls, and just to make our Chicago connection complete, the head of that would be our own Valerie Jarrett, senior advisor to the president and former trustee of the University of Chicago. And I know that they relied a lot on the work that was done by um, Ambassador Revere and Hillary Clinton when they were in the White House. So after uh, the Clintons left the White House, she helped co-found Vital Voices, which is an incredibly impactful organization to this day. Its mission is to unleash the leader, leadership potential of women around the world, to transform their lives, other lives, and in so doing, advance the causes of peace and prosperity. So when President Obama was elected um, and Hillary Clinton became the uh, Secretary of State, she prevailed upon her friend and colleague, Milan Revere, to come to the State Department, where she became the first ever ambassador at large on global women's issues. Um, this is unprecedented, and it shows the importance of women's issues in this administration so that women are an essential integral part of foreign policy, not just some separate thing some folks think about as just women's issues, but their impact on all aspects of foreign policy. Um, and when, when Milan was nominated, this is what Hillary Rodham Clinton said about her. Milan brings unwavering passion to any cause she adopts. For the, for the past 15 years, that cause has been the world's women and girls. Their rights, their opportunities, their central importance to our future progress and prosperity. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce the person who's been described as Hillary's secret weapon, Ambassador Milan Verveer. I love Susan dearly, but her definition of short and mine are very different. <laughs> it is um, truly a wonderful pleasure for me to be back on the Midway. Um, my husband was a student here in the law school, and uh, when I finished my graduate studies, I came out, and I remembered those years very fondly. And he is grateful to this day for the extraordinary education he got here. My colleague from the State Department, Wen Chi Yu, uh, was eager to come back to Chicago because she too uh, did her graduate studies here. So I am surrounded by beneficiaries of the education that this great institution affords. I want to thank Fumi for the uh, invitation. The dean said she's enthusiastic. I think that's probably understating it. Uh, she has got boundless energy and an enormous commitment uh, to what she does. And I think we're all grateful for um, the inaugural health day here at the university, global health, and the launch of the uh, University of Chicago Center for Global Health. And I want to thank my other good friend, uh, the former ambassador to The Hague, whom I've had the good fortune to work with, uh, Faye Hartog-Levin, uh, who is uh, another committed member of this university community. 
Uh, and of course, thank you, deans, both for for coming here today. Um, I really do commend the extraordinary work that is going on here with respect to this global health initiative, the international partnerships that you are forging uh, to build capacity to reduce reduce health disparities which are considerable in the developing world and at the same time educating an extraordinary group of next generation health leaders and I had sort of an appetizer of the banquet feast that is here clearly every day in the time I spent before coming into this hall with a few of them and hearing about the extraordinary interdisciplinary work uh, that is going on here that will, I am confident, uh, bring the kinds of results our world desperately needs. As you heard, the position that I have is a first for the United States government uh, and I think is a very significant re reflection of the President and Secretary of State's uh, deep commitment uh, for understanding why issues uh, that are appropriate to women's concerns uh, are critical for our foreign policy, whether it has to do with governance, the economies, uh, with respect to the environment, to global health, uh, you name it, and certainly to our security uh, as well, because no country can hope to get ahead if it leaves half of its people behind, and today, uh, if we're going to tackle these tough challenges, uh, we really need to have women uh, in all sectors uh, participating at all levels of society all over the world. Now, if the potential of women and girls is f to be truly fully developed, and if they are truly to participate equally as they must and should, we will see, I know, uh, because of the mounting evidence and data that reflects it, uh, that they will make great improvements to the lives of their families and communities, and I dare say their countries, uh, and the world will benefit as well. Unfortunately, the potential that women and girls represent uh, for the future of our world is still largely untapped and you can go through uh, various areas from dealing with issues of ending conflicts to dealing with growing economies uh, where there is growing evidence of the short changing we are doing not just to them but what we are doing to ourselves by not tapping uh, this potential. And I think we're long past the day where we can relegate these issues to uh, the margins. You know, that category of women's concerns, not quite that important. It's okay to work on it, but it's not the main act. Uh, and say that we're involved in more pressing um, issues. Because these are among the toughest issues that need to be solved. Uh, and we confront um, a great deal that needs to be addressed and we will not be able to do that without uh, incorporating all of our people in addressing our collective future. Or to put it as Secretary Clinton did, until women around the world are accorded their rights and afforded opportunities for education and health care and to participate fully economically and politically. Global progress and global prosperity will have its own glass ceiling. And no one knows better than all of you who are working in so many important areas to address some of the most uh, difficult challenges we have uh, how important it is to improve the health care of women and girls because in doing so that will have a significant impact on improving health care more broadly to their families and their communities. Yet progress on women's health has not been as significant as progress in other areas. The Millennium Development Goals that are 
set out to address poverty, global poverty, in a number of areas. MDG 5 pledges a three-quarter reduction in maternal mortality and universal access to reproductive health by 2015, which is around the corner. Yet today, a woman dies in childbirth somewhere in the world every 90 seconds. So we have our work cut out for us. While fighting for health care reform for the American people, President Obama has also advanced one of the most ad ambitious global health initiatives uh, of any development program we have seen that puts a major emphasis and commitment of resources to ending maternal mortality providing greater access to family planning, and improving women's access to a continuum of care through more significantly integrated health systems. Focusing on women and girls is the right thing to do because their unmet health needs are so significant because of their reproductive role and patterns of gender discrimination, they bear a disproportionate share of disease, violence, and mistreatment. A Lancet report has shown that up to half of the reductions in child mortality over the past several years can be attributed to the education of women and girls. Investments in women's health also lead to improvements in their children's health, and also set the stage for greater economic activity. No small matter uh, when it comes to improving overall health. The global rate of maternal mortality is clearly unacceptably high. Every year, an estimated 530,000 women die from largely preventable complications in pregnancy or childbirth. And for every woman who dies, 20 more suffer from injury, infection, or disease. 99% of maternal deaths and disabilities and health occur of, and health problems occur in the developing world. where, unfortunately, there has not been anywhere near the progress we need to see uh, in some time now. A woman in Africa may face a 1 in 26 lifetime risk of death during pregnancy and childbirth, compared to only 1 in 7,300 in a developed country. Now, neither should ever be acceptable, but these are the hard realities in much of the developing world. This divide is greater on maternal mortality than many other issues covered by the MDGs. Yet this is not to say that we don't continue to be, need to be concerned about what is happening in more prosperous countries, as clearly all of you in health-related fields are where we see differences in maternal mortality rates still predominantly uh, in affecting those in, in lower levels of income uh, and other unfavorable factors. Of over a half a million deaths due to pregnancy and childbirth that take place every year, an estimated 34% stem from unintended pregnancies, yet over 250 million women still lack access to modern forms of contraception. If we spent more on family planning as the President's Global Health Initiative sets out to do, and on ending maternal mortality, improvements in maternal health, we could cut this number of unintended pregnancies by more than two-thirds. AIDS is the leading cause of death among women between the ages of 15 to 44 worldwide 
and in sub-Saharan Africa, 61% of all adults living with HIV are women, which is why it is a disease with the face of a woman on it. It is spread in association with social dislocations, with violence against women, and so many other factors. But the great good news today is that we are in a very strong position to prevent once and for all the transmission of the HIV infection from the mother uh, to the child. Um, and those, those diminutions in the transmission are significant by some 45% and the trajectory is going in the right way with significant uh, commitments of new resources to do that. Statistics like these demonstrate that the dire health needs of women throughout the world are too often overlooked, not considered perhaps significantly important issues. And even where health services are available, the poor socioeconomic, educational, political, and legal status of women and girls too often prevent them for, from accessing the services that are available. So it is clear that by focusing on them, it is not only the right thing to be doing, but it is also the smart and effective thing to do. Women's health is important, not only for women, but for the entire family. According to the World Health Organization, some one million children are left motherless each year, and these children are 10 times more likely to die within two years of their mother's death. We know that women the world over are primarily responsible for care of their families. They are in charge of managing water, nutrition, and household resources. And they serve as the conduits to health care services for their families. Therefore, the ability of women to access health-related knowledge and services is fundamental to the health of their babies, older children, family members, and communities. I just returned from Guatemala, which has one of the highest rates of malnutrition uh, that is se severely impacting uh, that country. And it is also a very uh, significant country in terms of agriculture production. In addition to the Global Health Initiative, a companion significant initiative of the Obama administration has been Feed the Future that focuses on ways to enhance agriculture productivity and chip away at the severe hunger problems around the world. Now, one way to do that, as the proposal does, the initiative does, in all the priority countries where it is now working, and Guatemala is the one in the Western Hemisphere, is to recognize the role that women play in agriculture. They are, in many countries, the majority of the small farmers. But more often than not, they do not have equal access to the resources, whether it's seeds and fertilizer or it's credit and uh, opportunities to be at the decision-making table. But we know from the studies that have been done that when equalized, they can enhance their yields by 20 to 30 percent and in the aggregate change the productivity levels in ways that could feed another 150 million people. And when we were working on the indicators for the Feed the Future program, one of the key indicators to determine if a mother, a female farmer, is benefiting more significantly is the nutrition levels of her children. So we were talking earlier about all the interdisciplinary uh, connections that are critical to addressing in achieving solutions. This is an example of the kinds of things that uh, we are working on in terms of our development programs.
Improving the health of women and girls also enhances their productivity and social and economic uh, participation, which is a positive multiplier because women tend to spend the great majority of their income by reinvesting in their families and in their community and largely it's an education and health. So you have this double dividend, if you will, in terms of their uh, income, um, income uh, uh, where they invest their income. According to the World Bank, about 3.9 million women and girls go missing every year in the developing countries. Now why uh, is that a significant factor and what's it due to? About two-fifths are never born because of the significant efforts to ensure male uh, children. So sex selection uh, has become a big issue in uh, countries like China and India, but not just there. One-sixth die in early childhood and over one-third die in their reproductive years. And one of the very sad realities is that girls are not valued uh, the way that boys are in many, many societies. And that lack of valuing the girl, uh, and in fact m making very significant efforts uh, to ensure that one doesn't have a girl child, to the point where mothers have said that when they bear, don't bear a son, they feel they have completely failed. This all has huge coloration uh, and impact on uh, the kind of uh, activities that occur in societies from not sending a girl to school, a daughter to school, uh, to child marriage, uh, to feeding her last, if feeding her at all. Um, so again, these, this is another challenge that is related to the overall conditions of the health of women and girls. Among women aged 15 to 45, acts of violence cause more death and disability than cancer, malaria, traffic accidents, and war combined, according to the United Nations. There is a global epidemic in terms of violence against women and girls. Uh, and it ranges from domestic uh, abuse, uh, down through honor killings, through dowry burnings, to uh, rape as a tool of war, just huge, huge problems that we uh, more often than not read about uh, these days uh, in, our, um, in our newspapers. Now, investing in women and girls in development terms is one of the highest yield investments that can be made for poverty alleviation. And for these reasons, in putting together the Global Health Initiative, the Obama administration has pursued a woman and girl-centered approach uh, in several ways in its Global Health Initiative. First, by increasing support for programs that serve them, including maternal and child health, family planning, and nutrition programs. Secondly, by supporting long-term systemic changes to remove the economic, cultural, social, and legal barriers to health care services and increase the participation of women and girls in health care decisions. And through this kind of intervention, we are developing and strengthening health systems and addressing the social and behavioral determinants of health. All of these areas are critical to saving lives and reaching women and children with equitable, effective, and sustainable care. To this end, the 80 countries where we have global health programs have received specific guidance on how to integrate 
women, girls, and gender equality into our health and development programs. And the guidance requires all of the country missions to conduct a gender analysis prior to designing health programs and addressing issues like gender-based violence, the need for female health workers, the importance of involving men and boys, uh, religious and community leaders, people with uh, who are looked up to and who can validate uh, moving norms from where they are to where uh, they need to be. How does this really happen in practice? Well, let me just mention a few ways. The dire state of women and girls' health in many parts of the world does not stem from uncertainty about how to save their lives. We know that providing proven, evidence-based interventions, which all of you are about, such as skilled birth attendants, access to emergency obstetric care, pre- and post-natal care, access to family planning, etc., will do that. I have visited urban hospitals from Mumbai to Moscow, and I'm always impressed that what can be done in some of the most difficult circumstances to provide integrated services uh, to ensure safe births, access to family planning, and care for the child uh, from everything he or she needs, including their vaccinations. Bangladesh, for example, has, is a very poor country, but it is making great strides and has an enormous population. And it has been focused on building essential obstetrical care capacity and is seeing rapid declines in maternal mortality. In Dhaka, I went out to an area where there, were, uh, there was training going on for healthcare workers. They divided up a large city area to focus on the needs of the pregnant women, to take uh, an inventory of how their conditions were and who might uh, really face the prospect of a very difficult uh, birth situation or a difficult pregnancy in some way. Those were identified and moved in, in good time to a tertiary center not far away, tertiary sounds very grand, but believe me, these were very modest places where complications could be adequately addressed and lives saved. In Indonesia, I, I saw a neighborhood, a very, very poor neighborhood, where some of the doors were marked uh, in a way that made me raise the question, why did so many of these doors have a special uh, marker on them? And I was told that the community was very eager to ensure, through its leadership, that the pregnant women who had potential difficult pregnancies would get the emergency kind of care they needed. And this was having a long-term positive impact, again, on cutting down on maternal mortality uh, in places uh, where it is not always easy to deliver. We've also been working to strengthen our health systems to better respond to women's health needs by ensuring an adequate supply of trained health providers and adequate health facilities working to ensure also that maternal and reproductive health care is integrated throughout the global health programs. So a pregnant woman who, who seeks HIV AIDS treatment to prevent the transmission of her infection to her child should not have to leave that facility and not be able to access family planning or any of the health needs that her child will have now free from any prospect of getting the HIV infection, but it should be within an integrated system so that even if it's not the same place that is providing those services, they can be very ad adequately and helpfully co-located. And through PEPFAR, 
uh, much of that is happening today. And of course we need to address the myriad economic, cultural, social, and legal barriers that impede women's access uh, to needed health care. I would just really underscore again uh, the importance of a focus on adolescent girls uh, in global health because it all starts with a girl and they are among the most vulnerable and neglected area of emphasis. Uh, they represent some of the highest risk early pregnancies because many are getting pregnant at very young ages uh, and if maternal mortality isn't the outcome oftentimes it's fistula or other serious problems which we see in significant ways in sub-Saharan Africa. The violence that they are threatened by, whether in their homes, on the way to school, in school, in ways that is hard for any of us to fathom, uh, is one that has very serious health implications uh, for them. Uh, which is another reason that we have come together with PEPFAR uh, to to establish a public-private partnership program called Together for Girls that recognizes the impact of violence against girls uh, and the potential incidence of the HIV in infection uh, or other serious uh, health problems. One of the key solutions uh, in this area is obviously to have girls in school and stay in school because the dividends uh, for that are uh, not to be underestimated. Uh, and there are all kinds of incentive programs that have been put in place uh, to, to really uh, incentivize parents who don't see the need to educate a girl to put her in school and to enable her to stay in school. Um, I, I saw too long, not too long ago a program that provided an animal to the parents uh, to send their girl to school, a cow, which produces income for the family through the milk. But smartly, the incentive was done in the name of the girl. And so her father came to her and said, it's time to be married. She was 12 years old or so. And she said she had no interest in getting married. She wanted to stay in school. And she and her father, in her case, negotiated and went back and forth for some time. And typically, the girl is on the losing end of this proposition. In this case, he said uh, to her, no, it's going to happen. Uh, and she said, well, then I'm taking my cow. <laughs> And he said, no, the cow belongs to us. And she said, no, that cow was given to me. And that cow was the separation from her being pulled out of school staying to staying in school and having a better life and one that was potentially, is potentially, one filled with less risk to her health. It's just one example of the kinds of things as you're developing them uh, in various areas of health and interdisciplinary activity, the kinds of things that are being developed and thought through uh, to uh, have a kind of, this kind of impact on enabling the girl to prosper. And of course, you know this well. You are all in the science business, uh, but in the government it's not always been the case. We are working to improve monitoring, evaluation, and research in all of these areas so that we know what works, we are motivated by results, and all kinds of uh, steps are taken to ensure that the outcome of these various programs can be measured in terms of whether or not they're having the kind of income that was intended. Let me just tell you quickly about a program that Secretary Clinton visited in Tanzania, which is sponsored through a partnership between the United States government and the government of Tanzania and is a model 
of the coordinated services and care that the Global Health Initiative is being designed to support around the world. Some 500 patients visit the center each day for maternal and child health care, family planning, and HIV uh, AIDS treatment. While there, the secretary saw the, a number of the women, including the pregnant women, mothers bringing their small children in for checkups, people receiving treatment for malaria and HIV, all that could be done in one center, which is more atypical than typical. And that center improving access to the care that families so desperately needed in ways that they had never experienced before. And she also saw at the health center efforts being made to ed educate the community about health through plays against gender-based violence, through different modalities that could have an impact on the local people. So this isn't work just for government. Government has a huge responsibility. But it is through partnerships in large measure partnerships with other governments, with multilateral organizations, with civil society foundations, academic institutions like this one, and certainly with the private sector. Because this exemplary university is a key example of what is being done through this Center for Global Health and what even more will be done in the months and years ahead to engage many more individuals, groups, partner institutions in efforts to eliminate the health disparities in countries around the world. And I commend you greatly for what you are doing here. It is desperately needed and these are enormous challenges today with enormous consequences for the people impacted uh, for the conditions in their countries and for the state of our world. So as we move together to a world where everyone, men, women, boys and girls, have access to the health care that they need, I hope that we will at the same time redouble our efforts to include a focus on women and girls not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it is the smart, effective, and strategic thing to do. Because nothing less than the prosperity and stability of families, communities, and nations is at stake in this work that we are all together engaged in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Vivere. Thank you for that inspirational uh, uh, message. So we have time to get questions, and um, I've asked my staff to put, um, you know, um, cards uh, at your on your seat. So if you have any questions, maybe you can. Um, write them down and uh, Molly will get up and collect them. So thank you very much. I wanted to actually start with asking uh, um, Colm, uh, Dean, <laughs> um, to uh, maybe say something about Harris School and your interest in development uh, while we're uh, getting um, questions from the audience. You'll have to forgive the... This one. You'll have to forgive the inadequacy of my response. I had no idea that I was doing more than listening <laughs> with admiration to, uh, to, to Ambassador Beer's uh, comments, which I enjoy greatly. Uh, perhaps I should start by saying that, that, that what you had to say uh, really resonates very well with our program at the Harris School. Uh, so as a policy school, uh, we take the view that much of the work that's done at the university, although vital for the future of civilization, is not particularly relevant to its future over the next 20 or 30 years. 
and we feel that in public policy it's important that the work we look at should have some impact in society in something like the shorter term. It's not that we think it shouldn't have impact in the long term, it's we think that it should also have some impact in the shorter term. Uh, so we believe that the students whom we prepare, and most of our graduates, I should say, are MPPs, you know, Master in Public Policy, are people whom we expect to go out and function in society uh, rather than simply replicate the academy. So we also have PhD students whose function is, is slightly different. Uh, so when, when Ken uh, Polanski earlier on talked about uh, President Zimmer's uh, ambition for the university as being eminence and impact in public policy, we favor the impact side of this balance while not, of course, neglecting the eminence side. But we do have debates, and these take place all over the university, about what the right combination of these two things is. So to what extent are we trying to push forward theory in the sense of pure learning, and in what sense are we trying to apply that learning in a way that's significant for society? Uh, in my view, and I think the view of my colleagues at Harris, is that we should be judged by the impact that our work has rather than by our contribution to theory. Uh, and that's why it's a particular pleasure to, uh, to have conversations with other parts of the university who share this, uh, who share this ambition. Uh, Fumi and I have had a number of conversations, including one earlier today, uh, where it turned out that, uh, that our view at Harris and Fumi's view and the view of uh, at least a significant part of uh, uh, BSD in the medical school uh, is that we can work together in order to bring the methodology in which we train our students and the understanding of medicine and of disease that people get uh, on the other side of Ellis Avenue in a way that's beneficial to all. And, and I should mention also Colleen Grogan uh, Laura Butwinick and others at SSA uh, who also work in this area. So the way in which uh, I see our progress is coming is by bringing together all of the methodologies that we have at the university to tackle these problems which cannot be tackled by any discipline no matter how sophisticated those working in the discipline may be. So health is not a question of medical treatment alone, it's a question of health embedded in society and not understanding the framework of society means that uh, the clinical uh, capacity is much less significant than it might otherwise be. So, so I applaud the Ambassador for her remarks and for the work that she's doing with the current administration. I hope this will continue. I particularly like the, uh, the, the uh, reliance on evidence one of the great tragedies of development work over the generations uh, has been that money has been spent without any attempt to evaluate its impact. And this is one of the reasons why a great deal of it is wasted. And even the money that's not wasted doesn't lead to a replication because people aren't aware that it's been successful. So uh, all, I can, uh, all I can offer really is general approbation for the uh, for the fine work that you're doing and an enthusiastic uh, agreement with uh, our colleagues in BSD and Pritzker uh, that as they move forward on this, we'll be very happy to work with them. Very good. Thanks, Com. So um, I'm going to group the questions uh, in, in uh, different forms, and I hope that we can get through them. But uh, there's uh, uh, two or three people really wanting to ask, what's the biggest advance women's health has made during your time as ambassador? Or what lessons have we learned uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the achievements we've made that we can replicate? I'm not sure that the advances have been made in this uh, short term um, per se, but uh, there have been a number of um, directions that I think are now uh, picking up the pace uh, that will be uh, very uh, useful going forward. Uh, even in terms of uh, diminishing maternal mortality by virtue of what we know and the efforts being put in place today uh, to address it more significantly. Uh, I think that the fact that uh, a mother infected with HIV, for example, uh, today does not have to pass uh, that infection to her child is hugely significant. I was talking to the head of UNAIDS not too long ago and uh, really for a small amount of, of resources, comparatively speaking, uh, in this field, 
this is something that can be achieved fairly soon. Uh, and I think the consequences for something like that are just uh, extraordinary. A lot of this is not rocket science, if that's more complicated. Uh, a lot of this is really about putting together the kinds of um, knowledge and experience and success that we know. It's taking the things that are working to scale. That's where I think we don't do as good a job as we might do. Uh, and I was really encouraged by the discussion we were having earlier here on clean cook stoves. Because this is an issue that you might think, you know, how is this significant? And yet, whether it's the carbon, black carbon particles in the environment uh, that grow from this, or the very, very serious consequences for health, uh, which are measured today as uh, more consequential in terms of deaths related to it than malaria, uh, or the, the ways in which we can bring, on the positive side, science together with women's entrepreneurship, with development, to really begin to address this. We've known this is a problem for a long time. People tell me that for years they have recognized this is a really serious problem uh, in the developing world, and yet there hasn't been a whole lot of progress to show for it. But just in the last year, I was in a, um, a yurt in Mongolia and saw what it meant to now, for the first time, a family had its clean cook stove and was not breathing in those horrible emissions. Um, and I have seen in all around India efforts that are now being made, but they're huge issues. How do you get a good scientific product that will work in an environment, in a certain climate, with certain resources available, make it available in a way that isn't just a handout that may never be utilized, but actually do the development work that will have it be adapted in a sustainable way that will really make the difference in people's lives. So we haven't solved all these things, right. but I think we are definitely together moving in the right direction. Yeah, along those lines, so a few questions regarding culture. And, um, you know, um, one of the uh, people in the audience asked, you know, our son has been in Africa for six years teaching and building health clinics. And he thinks that the status of women is the key problem for the continent. How do we change attitudes towards women? Well, I, I agree with your son, whoever you are. Um, <laughs> it is a big problem. And it, it, the norms that affect uh, the kind of progress that needs to be made are deeply entrenched. I don't think it's going to happen without men being very involved in the solution, uh, nor without leaders who are um, respected in a community. Let me give you an example. FGM, female genital mutilation, is a very big problem in a, in a number of uh, societies. Uh, it is, you can pass the law, and that's good. It says that it's a human rights violation, but will you really change behavior by passing the law? You need heat at the top and you need heat at the bottom. There's a very successful NGO called Tostan that's been operating, uh, now completely eradicated um, FGM in Senegal and moving similarly in many other countries. What have they done? to make it successful. They have taken the norm, which is every girl has to go through this rite of passage for her to have the kind of life she wants in terms of her marriage, her prospects, whatever. That is the norm, that's what's always been done. Now, on the other side, we know it's a very serious health issue. It leads to often to death in childbirth, birth, it leads to severe uh, health problems of other kinds, and it's one that no health practitioner worth his or her uh, degree uh, or respectability would, would condone. But how do you move a deeply entrenched norm from here to here? 
What they did through Tustan, and I saw some of this firsthand, was the, the women said it was a problem they wanted solved because it was so affecting their lives. They went to the village leader and to the Iman. The latter said, this is not part of the Quran. There's, there's nothing that condones this practice. The village leader began to listen and over time, it takes some time to change this, the community came together. This village came together. They began to hear why it was a serious problem that they should deal with and change. So this first village bandit among all of their villagers. They realized they intermarry with other villages. So they moved to the other villages. Who led them to the other villages? The imam and the village tribal chief saying this is what we did for our women, this is what you should do for your women. I met with them once, a group of them, when um, Secretary Clinton was in, uh, uh, in, in Senegal. They, ha they came from their village to meet with her. And it wasn't the women talking, and that was fine. It was all the prominent men in the various villagers telling her how they managed to do this. So it, it there's a lot of community awareness that has to go on. There's a lot of work that needs to be done at that level. You can prescribe all kinds of good behavior, but if, if the norm is somewhere else and the entrenched practices has always been in that place, you will not change anything or you will change very little. So we have to be a lot smarter about how we get these things done. So on being smarter about how we get things done, our students want to know what should they do to help make an impact? Because they want to get on the bandwagon. I think you all should do what you are doing. Just being here, being engaged, uh, listening to you even for the short period of time we had, some of you earlier. Uh, the exciting work that's going on among, between disciplines. Uh, the, the focus on outcomes and how to get there. These are the very places from where change will come. Uh, and you're going, and I saw so many photos of some of the students who have done work uh, overseas, just going and being part of the efforts there and taking your experience. And I hope more and more being able to go in teams as resources are available. Uh, to help address these situations in ways that are appropriate uh, to those places that will bring the results. Uh, it sounds compelling to me to say something is good for your health, therefore you should do it. <laughs> that is hardly the most compelling argument in most of these places. In fact, it doesn't hold up much at all. Yeah. So this takes a lot of creativity, it takes building on the knowledge base. Uh, it takes um, learning from what's happened and didn't work and moving forward to the point where success and good results can come and then taking all of that to scale because that's what we need. We need scale. And I think all of you are on the cutting edge of just those very kind of breakthroughs, which is why I was so pleased to be able to come today. Thank you so much. So the final question I'm going to ask you, since we have a debate tonight on foreign oh. policy, and since I live on the south side of Chicago, and everyone is always asking, why are we going abroad when we could be right here in our own backyard and solve the problems of the south side of Chicago? So why should we engage internationally? We have enough problems of our own. There's not enough well, resources. Well, there is no doubt that we've got more than our share of problems at home. But if we only single focus here and don't look what's happening elsewhere, it will affect us here at home before we know it. Because so many of these issues, uh, they're moral issues to be contended with, to be sure but take places where women's rights are denied or they are other ways oppressed. Those 
are often the conditions for some of the worst things happening in countries. Uh, look at those places and you will tomorrow find us struggling with how we are going to respond because our own security is at stake. You can get on an airplane, all of you know this better than anybody, uh, and, in, and one person sitting there carrying some disease from some remote place is going to affect everybody if it's an airborne contagion. There are not borders anymore in the ways there used to be. Uh, so we have to really live in this global world. We know what happens in economics. Uh, in one place and what that does to every other place. We are recipients of some of that ourselves and others believe that we have perpetrated it against them. But the walls are gone. The borders are not the same. Uh, and we just have the compelling assignment to pay attention both at home and overseas because there is no other way out. Thank you so much Ambassador Milan. For I'm sure you. I'm sure you. You all want me to thank her for this wonderful uh, uh, keynote. Um, I want to take the opportunity to thank my staff, uh, Molly, and. Uh, in Kem and people who really made this happen. Jeanette, out there, can you stand up? And members of the uh, Global Health Initiative Executive and Steering Committee that are here, because you really pulled this up. So, Mark, you stand up. <laughs> uh, because, uh, really, we couldn't, we couldn't have done this without the, the uh, faculty that's really been pushing this. Scott Stern, everyone. Uh, I want to uh, invite you to the reception that follows where there would be more opportunities to, for us to continue the conversation. I want to thank the women of Chicago that I know, Suzanne, <laughs> and uh, former Ambassador uh, Faye, uh, Levine, because I know they're going to continue this conversation. And of course, we can't forget the men in our lives, <laughs> because together we're going to make this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. So as you are leaving, I just want to announce the winners of the uh, photographic uh, competition. So third place is Kara Smith, second place Jemaine Kim, and first place Wen Chen Tu. Uh, see Molly for your prizes. Thanks.